So that's the bridge. So now if you guys were to do an intro just by yourselves. Yeah, you like, you know, like, like, like we were marching down the street to it. You know, I mean, even though it's this, like, it, like that, that would be like, I imagine that's kind of like it. You hear about different cultures around the world trying to preserve their history. Native Americans hand down stories from generation to generation. And you have museums all over the world preserving art and culture. I honestly believe that we should be doing the same thing just with music. That's what this place is all about. The pace of the city has a lot to do with how we feel about things. Those paddle wheels make a distinctive rhythm. Streetcar going down St. Charles Avenue, making this clackety clackety sound. We've become complacent with some old world charm. Oh man, when you get steeped in the, the history, you get seduced by it. You go to sleep with live music, you wake up with live music. Literally. It's just like no other place on the earth. Being from here is in the fabric of what we do. No matter what type of music we're playing, you'll hear New Orleans there. A 
city like New Orleans, I was so drawn to it because in a way, that's what this entire series is all about. Rock and roll is really the evolution of jazz. When Louis Armstrong's Hot 7 albums first came out, people, people lost their minds. It was punk rock, you know? It was, it was out of control. A lot of the jazz musicians became the first wave of rock and roll musicians. I went there to be educated because I never went to school. And I thought, I'm going to go to where the stuff came out of the ground naturally, you know? You say either, I say either, you say neither, and I say neither, either, either, and either, neither. Uh, let's call the whole thing off. You can't speak of New Orleans without speaking of Dr. John. Now leave a little room for me. Most people I talk to don't call you Dr. John. Well, my name is really Mag Rabinac. Where are you from? Well, I'm from the third ward. Same ward where Louis Armstrong came from. Every time my pa passed where Louis Armstrong used to live, he'd say, if you want to do something bad enough, you can do it. That made me think. Is it a musical family? Well, my Aunt Daddy May used to play piano with Pete Fountain and George. She used to say, watch the piano player's left hand. It's important. That's what I did. She was a very special person. You're from New Orleans the way we are. Like, you're not just from New Orleans. Like You're four generations, five generations from New Orleans. Growing up and being like the son of a, a musician is When I think of New Orleans, I don't think of recording studios, really. I just think of hundreds of years of music. Preservation Hall really took hold after the hurricane, when people realized that there was something to lose. Wow, yeah. That's a trip. So you can see it. Yeah. This is a trip. It was a little tricky because Preservation Jazz Hall is not used to a blaring rock band. We 
move the drums across the room from traditionally where they play, which open up. In the street, you hear the horses clip clop by and the carriages and people peering in the windows and the street performers strolling by. Our microphones catch miscellaneous noises going on and that's part of the charm. Where's Ben Jappy? Hey Ben! It's place is so thick with vibe you know it's just you just feel like the sweat of generations you know pouring off the walls see all our gear in there And then over the years, it's been a lot of things. It was a photo studio where most of uptown aristocracy would come downtown and get their photos taken. So you. So how did your dad start Preservation Hall? He had played tuba. He went to military high school on a tuba scholarship. But, you know, in college he was a business major and, you know, didn't really think of himself as, definitely was not a jazz tuba player. He was a marching band tuba player. And when he got to New Orleans, they discovered this whole tradition of marching bands. What we have here is called jazz funerals. You know, the first part of the ceremony is slow dirge music. Back in the day, it was more like marching bands, with real uniform and, and polished. Uh, we're talking before integration here when the black cemeteries was way out of town. They play solemn music when they cut the body loose, as they call it, and turn back around, the band will crank up. Gotta make that long walk back. It certainly is hipper to dance and strut back than it would be to walk back. The brass band that was playing in front would be considered the first. Just the everyday people on the street. People who don't even know who it is that's dead. Thousands and thousands of people with these brass instruments, drums, jumping up in the street. It's just a beautiful thing. My parents came across one of these bands the first week they were in town, and they followed the band through the French Quarter, and they ended up back at this art gallery on St. Peter Street, two blocks from Jackson Square. And they met all of these people they met artists and writers and poets and uh, 
actors and photographers, and they all congregated in this one gallery for whatever reason. This was like the meeting place for everybody, and that eventually became Preservation Hall. somehow to save the only art form that is strictly, entirely American. One effort to save it is here at... Mr. Jaffe integrated things long before anybody else thought about it. This was one of the few places where black and white people would come together to listen to music. It was the only place. It was the place. And my parents risked a lot by being open about it, their policies, and outspoken about it. Yeah. It was very difficult to hear uh, New Orleans, jazz in New Orleans, a few years ago. So we rented an old art gallery and began Preservation Hall. Both of your parents took the responsibility? Yeah, well, my mom, my mom was like the bouncer. She sat at the gate all night collecting money and like deciding on who would get in and who wouldn't. Because people would be rowdy. And my dad was the guy who was, you know, going around town locating musicians and putting the bands together and kind of keeping the, the place physically in shape. People are sitting on wooden benches, sitting on the floor. There's no drink. Pretty hot in there too in the summer. People come to hear the music. People hear it. That music was dying. You know, trad jazz like that was dying. Ben's dad bought that place and started putting on those. You know, it's a. It's The ones that are still alive, that's where they're playing now. And that's where all the people all over the world, community, New Orleans, this place they want to know where the Preservation Hall is. When you become a member of the Preservation Hall band, you sort of, you come up through the ranks. Our, our clarinet player, um, Charlie Gabriel, he's 82. So, um, so what we were thinking for the intro would, um, to do a variation of that riff, but swing it a little more. Do the riff. He's a fourth generation musician. And then to play around it. His great great grandfather was a musician in New Orleans in the 1840s. Our trumpet player, fourth generation our drummer, you know, fourth generation. Yeah, I think we should just go uh, round everyone up and just start playing. All right, let's and then we'll hit record. All right, that's how I go Sounds around. fine? You, you don't, you can't create that, you know, it, and we wouldn't exist if that didn't exist. It's just wonderful how it gets passed along and passed along here. And it right on you. So whenever I play my trombone solo, I gotta stand all the way in back.
This is like the last place. I mean, it really is. I mean, now the, the, the name of the joint's becoming literal, you know, because it's, it's the, the last place. has been my biggest inspiration in music in my adult life. I mean, I really got into Dr. John and Professor Longhair. Not that I can play like Bess or Dr. John. When Dave mentioned we were going there, I'm like, we're going where? What? It's been like this kind of like temple for me to, to go every time I stop in. That first day, I look at my email of kind of what's going on the first day, just setting up, and it says, Dave, interview Alan Toussaint. I'm like, what? Holy shit. I'm like, oh, this is gonna be a really good week. Definitely a bucket list situation. Yeah. Okay, the first question I always ask everybody is, where are you from? Oh, I'm from New Orleans, very much so, yes. I was raised in an area called Great Town, which is right here in town. What do you remember about that time? You know, this city was still segregated in so many ways. It's true, but we were integrated with each other because we had accepted the fact, so you're a musician too, of course we're going to play something. It was actually on the law books that it was against the law for black and white musicians to perform on the same stage, you know, be in the same room and all this kind of stuff. Like, Mac went to jail from being in a dewdrop. I was really pissed off. There was these two police. I'm thinking, oh, shit, they're gonna break my legs. The story goes, he looked around and said, Y'all get ready to come back and get me next week because Ray Charles playing here and I'm coming back. It just seemed jive to me. That's life. I would still be playing the guitar. What? Really? That's fucking crazy. How did that happen? Well, this guy was pistol whipping the singer of my band. This was a problem. His mama was cutting some meat, and she told me if anything happened to him while he was on the road with me, I'm going to chop your cojones off. I remembered that. It kind of freaked me out. Anyway. When I was hitting the guy, the gun went off. It was really crazy. Falling you a bit great on that. When I was growing up, part of the scene. It was extremely important to our music. I mean, they are first family of funk. At times, I'd come into the living room at my house, and there he was standing up in the living room talking to my brothers. Yeah, all these cats was great. Sometime I would be handed the drumsticks. I always prayed that I could make people feel the same way Ray Charles made me feel. Those guys would always make a good blend. We was always playing it together from way back in the game. It was slamming. Mac became Dr. John. 
be ashamed to call the doctor when there ain't nobody left. Tell you that. Seemed like a whole nother life. Another person came in and started something new over here. You say somebody's ripping out your mind. He's a character, man. You feel in your heart that you're so inclined. What's his deal? He's just an he original from? cat. He's, he's cooler than you. And he's cooler than everybody you'll ever meet. Did you create Dr. John to be a front man? No. I was going to make Ronnie Barron be Dr. John, and I was going to call him Reverend Ether. Frank Sinatra's manager or arranger or whatever the hell he was said, if Sonny and Cheryl could sing, and if Bob Dylan could sing, you could sing, asshole. I think he hit a raw nerve with me, and it, it hit home. He's amazing. You know, it's like everything that he plays is the best thing ever. It's perfectly behind the beat. Just everything he knows about music is so pure and so... And there are faces I don't remember. It's that guy's bachelor party this week. I fucking met that dude yesterday. Right there. The dude with the fucking headband and the sunglasses. Oh, not him. Yeah. No way. Yeah. I told him we were playing here tonight. And his dad. He's with his dad. What's up? <laughs> Dude's in the headband. <laughs> he brought his dad on his batch party. They are fucking down. Now is the time. Alan Toussaint, he's like the guru, man. It's been a long time since I didn't know who Alan Toussaint was. He's written every famous song that is known for being New Orleans. Everybody that I grew up listening to, Alan had something to do with. You know, I mean, everything from all the Irma Thomas stuff, all of my brother Aaron stuff. Lee Darcy, he wasn't just the cat writing the songs. He actually was the cat in the studio that was making that stuff sound like that. Please, please stop it now. That's what I wanted to know how to do. Write the songs and then make people love them and go buy them. <laughs> And he was a master at it. OK, ladies, uh, I don't think you ought to make that in the middle of that. I think you should wait till the verse comes up. There's certain things you could tell that's an Allen thing. One of my favorite songs is, is a song called Street Parade by Earl King. With the meters playing, Earl King is singing, Alan wrote the horn parts. I don't think they repeat themselves the whole time. These horn parts never repeat. And he told me, imagine you're going to die in two weeks. So I wrote Southern Nights. When I was a little boy, on about six, my father would take us out to the country to visit our old 
relatives out there, all of them spoke Creole, very little English. So I'd sit on the porch and I'd look up into the trees and everything was above me. As writers, we would like to be inspired all the time. We would like the clouds to open up and receive us. Southern Night was a song that did that. It was a kind of spiritual feeling to be in that environment and to know where we came from so we know where we're going. Yeah, all these cities had so much to offer, musically and culturally. And then sometimes there's obstacles. Sometimes it's weather, or in the case of New Orleans. We recorded in the middle of the French Quarter. Killer take. Yeah. Let's call Dave Grohl in here. Yeah. This is a bar. You know, if you put a guy like Dave in New Orleans. back to the bar. I don't know where New Orleans music would be today if it wouldn't be for what, what the meters created back in the day. The meters are like the Beatles here in New Orleans for us. I think the meters turned out to be is the embodiment of everything we sitting here talking about. They're just straight up New Orleans funk. Leo Nocentelli on guitar. Zigaboo, Motilis on drums. And the bass player, George Porter. The Neville brothers were Art and Aaron. They were like a part of the fiber of the early days of the meters. I discovered the meters through Led Zeppelin. I read somewhere that the meters were I was fascinated with Ziggy, the drummer. such a strange, unorthodox, different way of approaching rhythm. I never heard it before. He was very syncopated. He used the ands of one way more than normal drummers would use. I guarantee you can count on me to have a real good time. And when he makes them, I would read him. You know, I know it's coming, so I would and with him. You know? It's just how he felt. He played how he felt. It's just the artistic air around New Orleans. It's like a gas that's leaking out, and everybody is, you know, inhaling and exhaling it, and all of a sudden, boom. Because I was invited to make this record with the Neville Brothers, we were rummaging through a bunch of cassettes, 
and we bumped into a whole box of cassettes that were the meters rehearsals. I couldn't hear a word they were saying because I'm Canadian and they're from New Orleans. And so Zig, the drummer, he's trying to describe something to the rest of the band in another language. Oh, oh man, come on, come on. It sounded like some strange Japanese to me. I always thought from the very beginning that this group were like song stylists. And that's where we got our peculiar and extraordinary talent meshed together to come and make one whole music. <laughs> That's the thing I remember. <laughs> Don't mind me, I'm crazy. <laughs> Thank you. We kind of invented a form for New Orleans, that beautiful meter sound, you know? Not getting any cooler in here. Hawkins is glistening, man. Looks like a big old tray of deli meat left out. It's summertime. Dripping with the juices. Taylor juice. Au jus. <laughs> Could I have some Taylor au jus? <laughs> no, I'm all good, dude. All right, y'all ready? Yeah, we are rolling. <laughs> Without a doubt, the hottest performance of our entire career was at Jazz Fest. And I mean that in a meteorological sense, because it was fucking hot. I looked at some of those gospel bands singing in those robes, god damn. I remember being asked to play and thinking, God, do we belong there? I was honored to be asked because all of the music was so real. How long has Jazz Fest been going, do you know? I think it was like 1969 was the first Jazz Fest. Jazz Fest was supposed to be festival and folk festival. Civic leaders in New Orleans brought him down saying, we want you to do that here in New Orleans for, you know, and he came down, he's like, can't do it. I've wanted to do a festival in New Orleans for many years. It was very difficult in the early days because it was before the Civil Rights Bill was passed in 1964. I came down here as early as 1962 and uh, tried to get them to understand that they couldn't do a festival uh, with the laws they had in the books. He's like, you know, until these hotels will allow Duke Ellington and Miles Davis and Dizzy Gillespie to stay in their rooms and eat in these restaurants, it's not gonna happen. It took, you know, 10 years before the, the city became completely integrated. Have you been to every one of them? Almost all of them. How many times have you been to Jazz Fest? Every year. Of your life? Yeah. First time I played Jazz Fest, I think I was four years old. The horn was taller than me. I, I've been knowing him since he was that tall. <laughs> His name is Trombone Shorty because he's been playing it since the trombone was taller than him. We used to hustle in Jackson Square for tips. We just wanted him to stand there with a the trombone because it was so cute. People would tip us out, and then he actually started to like learn how to play. You know, I remember my mom telling me the story. Bo Diddley was on the stage, and if I was playing the parade part, Bo was I could just play one loud note. I was playing that note, and my mom was like, "Shh, you don't get us put out of here." And so I kept doing it, and Bo Diddley, like, who is that stepping on my? Story? on stage with Bo Diddley. That's crazy. Yeah. He's become, well, I'll put it like this. The Neville brothers have been closing our jazz fest since Professor Long had passed away. When the Neville brothers decided that they weren't going He 
he's a monster. I mean, it's unbelievable. One of the things I believe in Indian sound. The music there exists because the culture itself is so rich to begin with. It's not just the deep south. New Orleans is the northernmost point in the Caribbean. New Orleans was the largest port for a century. It's where coffee entered. America. It was the entry point for Central America, South America. ...of Africans were brought into the United States and sold into slavery. This was a place where people from a lot of different places met, traded goods and ideas. And some of those ideas was musical. You listen to the music and you can pick out all the ingredients from all those different styles. You know, you can pick out Spanish melodies and you can pick out African rhythms. Well, you know, the, the Bo Diddley riff is just an African riff. Bonk, 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 bonk. Rock and roll, and we built on that. You and that hand job has got to go. There's a place called Congo Square. And this was the only place in the South where black people could actually have drums, because that was outlawed. Sunday in Congo Square, and these cats played that music to commune with their ancestors. This famous pianist, I think his last name was Gacho, and he wrote this thing called the Bambula. His music was based on what he heard being played at Congo Square. That was part of our natural evolution. Absolutely. Could I? Oh, yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. Okay. That's, That's the way we used to do it back in the day with Jesse Hill, Professor Longhead, Dr. Jones. Go by her house. Oh, my God, I would love to. That'd be so fun. Uh -huh. Jadooki do. Uh -huh. Jadooki do. I love. The importance of the music to the people is what really blew me away. How you doing? Yeah, man, how you making out, man? All right, not bad. This is my aunt, man. Hello, I'm Dave. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. How are you doing? Yeah. This is where we normally jam at. Everybody know to come here when you guys start singing this song? Oh, yeah. <laughs> my grandfather was one of the ones who introduced the drums to the church. That's right. You know, Ben told me about that. It's an honorable, respectable family tradition. 
so much that you have it passed down from generation to generation. It just brings so much joy to all of us when we can just come together and, and be able to just play together. I don't know if every city considers music to be that important. And as a musician, I mean, that's the Holy Land. Right now, the storm is 225 miles south of southeast of the mouth of the Mississippi River. We had a little gazebo in front of the house. I was just sitting on a swing in my pajamas, just swinging, enjoying that, that smell and that water and that moisture in the air. I love that smell. I was not going anywhere. I knew that there was a, a group of I say, nah. Then we were supposed to be coming home the day that that thing hit. So we were all in a hotel in Memphis. We all went to bed that night. as you thought it would be? Yeah, it is. Um, being on the, on, the, on the good side of it, uh, I, I think we fared very well. I knew people that lived on the other side that were raking up their lawns. Like, the hurricane had passed. It was all gone. They're outside raking, and then all of a sudden, here comes water. Where is this coming from? We're looking at TV and then saw people. I gotta go, okay? I just gotta focus on driving here, okay? Was it just total chaos? It wasn't, um, it wasn't total chaos, but there was desperation. We have no protection back here. We have nothing to eat. We, this is our lives, y'all. There wasn't food. That and I can see that levee that broke. Walked to the top of a bridge and looked. Everything was just gone. I have young people and friends of my sons who wound up in our house. And then when the flood came, they had to walk through that water all the way to the Superdome. And then they said after they got in the Superdome, they wished they had stayed out in the water. We want out of here today. We had enough. We can't take no more. We're hungry. We're starving. We need help. I thought we need medical attention. They got, they got old people that sick. They got people dying. Uh, this stuff, you don't never get over something like that. You just learn to live with what the result of it was, you know? I mean, I have nightmares about things that people told me they went through. We all had huge losses. We lost property, we lost businesses, we lost family members. Told us to bring our families here. Now my mama's out there. She was an old person, and I don't have nothing no more. Nobody else. It's a mess, and it was like. My daughter was cooking chicken and my wife was cooking beans that we'll have food, to, you know, for the for a day or two in, in the city. Halfway out the city, everyone said, God damn, I left all the food home. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Did you feel like the entire city sort of came together when all that? Yeah. I mean, you had to, you know? You, that's all you had was each other. There's eight guys in the band. Seven of them lost their houses. You know, they could have just given up, fallen to our knees, you know? And it, instead, it was like we, we each, like, pulled each other up. With Katrina, that's when we dug deep to pull our lives back together and use the culture to help lead us home. That's something that I'm, I'm just, you know, honored to, like, have been a part of what these guys did after the hurricane. Passion goes such a long way, doesn't it? If it comes from the heart, it comes from a real place, you know? Like, here we are, like, 10 years later, and it's unbelievable, you know, 150 kids playing the music that, like, my parents helped preserve 50 years ago. I think that that's beautiful. people from the city appreciate the music a bit more. I think after the storm, some type of way, it, we got a lot of young musicians that just popped up out of the blue. I have no idea from where, and it, they're influenced by the preservation of It's really crazy. Like, every time I come back, I'm seeing some new musicians, which is cool, you know, and they're moving the music forward. If that hurricane wasn't enough to push them out, then nothing's gonna make those people leave that city. I wish I lived in a city like that. I wish I lived in a city where every Sunday you could have a second line parade. A band marches down the street and people come out of their houses and they dance along and you're walking down the street next to a lawyer, who's next to a gangster, who's next to a librarian, who's next to a college student, who's next to a policeman, and we're drinking and smiling, and everyone's getting along so well. I feel like if only every city in America had one day a week where we could all get together and march down the street dancing, we'd be a much happier human race.
Just as good.